Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video I, we're going to continue with our discussion on pulmonary ventilation and really focus on the processes of inspiration and expiration and which muscles are involved. Remember what we learned in the previous video where you were introduced to Boyle's Law and there you learned that the pressure of a gas is always inversely related to its volume and all gases follow their pressure gradients. Very important for you to remember. So this means that a gas will always move from a higher pressure environment to a lower pressure environment. And so how can we create this kind of a gradient? Well, if we increase the volume, remember, then we're going to decrease the pressure and vice versa. When we decrease the volume, we're going to increase the pressure. So literally, what we can do is play around with the volume of our thoracic cavity. We're going to make it bigger and we're going to make it smaller and that's going to therefore change our pressures such that the pressures on the inside of our lungs is going to, are going to be less than the atmospheric pressure or higher than the atmospheric pressure. So let's take a look. So on the left hand side here you see a nice flow chart that explains what the different steps are in order for us to bring air in uh, rather passively, meaning by allowing for the air to follow uh, its pressure gradient by moving from a higher pressure environment to a lower pressure environment. So if air has to enter into our lungs, that means that our lungs need to have a lower pressure compared to the, as compared to the atmosphere. So if the atmosphere here is here, this pressure should be higher than higher than the pressure in inside of our uh, thoracic cavity or inside of our lungs. And how do we accomplish that? Well, we can just increase the size of our thoracic cavity. And by this, we recruit some muscles. More specifically, we recruit two kinds of muscles. We're first of all going to contract the diaphragm. At rest, the diaphragm is dome-shaped, and when we contract it, it's going to be moving down, therefore stretching out our thoracic cavity. So now we have lengthened it. In that way, we've already begun to increase its volume. At the same time, the external intercostal muscles. These are one set of muscles that we find in between the ribs. They're going to contract and they're actually going to deepen the thoracic cavity. They work kind of like the handle of a bucket. You know, when you, when you lift up the handle of the bucket, the, the handle begins to rotate up to um, a level that is similar to what our ribs do when they are lifted up by the contraction of these muscles. And consequently, your, the, the depth of your thoracic cavity increases. So the external intercostal muscles increase the depth, therefore increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity, while the diaphragm increases the length. This combined with an increase in depth really um, creates uh, a much greater volume to where the pressure inside of the, the cavity drops enough to where air can now uh, very easily uh, follow its pressure gradient. So air enters into our trachea down into our lungs. When we relax the diaphragm, Notice that the diaphragm goes back to its very dome-shaped structure. It just relaxes. And that is typically enough for the, the, the rib cage to go back to its original size and shape 
as long as those external intercostal muscles relax as well. So the, the, of these two processes, inspiration is the only one that is actually an active contraction of muscles. Expiration, on the other hand, is a passive process. Once again, in the case of expiration, we're just merely going to relax the diaphragm, relax the intercostals, because when we do that, we're now reducing the size of the thoracic cavity. We've gone from a distended thoracic cavity to a much smaller one as we relax those two sets of muscles. And therefore, we reduce the volume of our thoracic cavity. The inverse relationship between volume and pressure means that the pressure inside of the lungs increases such that we can allow for the air to exit along its pressure gradient. So breathing at rest, and again, this is all happening at rest, what we just described, inspiration and expiration. Breathing at rest occurs by the contraction and relaxation of the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. There are also internal intercostal muscles, by the way, but we do not use them in our breathing at rest. We can recruit the internal intercostals for forced expiration. So when we want to reduce the size of the thoracic cavity even more, we can contract the internal intercostals to increase the pressure inside of the lungs even more so than at rest. And there are quite a few muscles involved in forced inspiration or in forced expiration. Take a look at your book and see which muscles are involved. And I've already given you example of which muscles can be recruited for forced expiration. Now, it is also really important for you to recall which nerves innervate these muscles. The diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerves. The phrenic nerves arise from the cervical region of the spinal cord. Your intercostal muscles are going to be innervated by the intercostal nerves. And these are also spinal nerves. So none of these are cranial nerves. Notice that since the phrenic nerves arise from the cervical region of your spinal cord, that breaking your neck, as we say in layman's terms, could potentially damage these phrenic nerves, which is what happened to Christopher Reeves. And that is going to make it impossible for us to be able to inspire again. Remember, the diaphragm, along with the external intercostals, are the only muscles we need to inhale. And this wraps up our discussion of the whole process of inspiration and the process of expiration.